was a small town in the middle of nowhere that was known for its strange occurrences and haunted houses. Visitors would come from all over to visit the town and explore the various haunted destinations. Each destination had a specific story and atmosphere to give it a unique personality. There was one particular house that stood out as the creepiest of them all though. It was an old, dilapidated mansion that had been abandoned for decades. Some said that the owner had gone mad and killed his family before disappearing without a trace. Others claimed that the house was cursed and anyone who entered it would meet their demise. The story of the house was definitely in question as no one could pinpoint exactly what happened at the old house. How is it still standing after years of abandonment? The windows letting in the harsh environment all year was anyone's guess. As the windows were broken, letting in the harsh environment all year, it was anyone's guess. But it still stood tall, telling a story of what used to be elegance and luxury. It was a sight to see, that is, from the outside. As strange as it seems, the many visitors that came to the town would go to the old house and take pictures, but they would never go in the house. It was the weirdest thing. No matter how much they wanted to go, they didn't want to go in the house when the time came. There was some kind of odd group think that made a group standing outside the old house look at each other and decide collectively not to enter the front door. They would walk the perimeter. They would look in the windows and doors. But something compelled them to think twice before entering the house. It is probably that mysterious force that has saved many lives. Despite the rumors, a group of thrill-seeking teenagers decided to explore the house one night. They had all been hanging out together and taking some substance that didn't even have a street name yet. They were playing Ghost in the Graveyard at an actual graveyard. As the effects of the substance was going through their body, they were all laughing and having the time of their lives. After the full effects were felt, they all looked at each other almost at the same time. It was time to explore the old house once and for all. They all rode together to the house. There it was, the three-story house that would have been considered a mansion back in its time. It stood tall and intimidating, but it was no match for the group. Together, they all walked right through the door. There was no external presence this time though, no voice telling them to stop. They all entered the house. As they entered, they were greeted by the musty smell of decay and the creaking of old floorboards. There was total silence at first, but a windy howl could be heard that got progressively louder over time. As they started to walk through the house, every step made a loud, creaking sound. It felt like the floor could cave in at any minute. Because they were on something, the creaks were deafening. They could hear every creak every time they stepped. They could hear every plank of wood compress as their feet applied pressure. With this, their hearts began to beat heavier and heavier, which they also felt. However, they felt like their heart was physically moving their shirts with every beat. Their heartbeat felt like that heavy feeling you felt when standing next to a big speaker. Suddenly, their thoughts had sobered up. As they proceeded, they all looked at each other wondering if this was a good idea. They cautiously made their way through the dark, cramped corridors, each step echoing loudly in silence. Suddenly, they heard a loud noise behind them in the long hallway. They had gone from a little scared to absolutely terrified. No one wanted to turn and see what had just made the noise, but they had to. One of them got the courage. They turned and saw a ghostly figure levitated above the ground and coming right towards the group. The teenagers screamed and ran out of the hallway as fast as they possibly could, knocking down picture frames. Three of the teenagers had escaped the house, with one more heading towards the door. Suddenly, a chair slid across the room and went right under the teenager's legs, knocking him on his back. As the teenager looked up in pain, he could see a beautiful chandelier that had been consumed with cobwebs over time. His view of the beautiful man-made spectacle was short-lived as he saw it rushing towards his face. It collapsed on his head perfectly, causing fatal damage to his skull. The other guys saw it happen and ran for their lives. 
When the group was a safe distance away from the house, they called the police. When the cops arrived, they said it was an accident. They all knew better. It was an angry ghost that did not like anyone intruding on its property. Be careful taking substances, but especially if you're going to explore haunted places. The teenagers never got the warning that everybody else got to stay away from the house because their decision-making abilities were inhibited, blocking the only friendly voice, the only friendly voice that was there to protect people from entering the dangerous house. By the time they realized something was wrong, it was already too late. Happy exploring, everybody. A group of friends were driving through the deserted countryside in the middle of nowhere. The land was bearing with no buildings or cars. They were all talking about the road trip they were on and all the fun they were having getting together once again. They were all friends from a long time ago and they were doing a cross country through Utah. There were many hiking trails and rock formations for visitors to explore, but where they currently were was nothing. Suddenly, they spotted a woman walking on the side of the road. She was dressed in ragged clothes and seemed lost and alone. She looked like she had been through a lot. The friends stopped the car after passing the woman by. They all looked at each other and thought of the situation. There was a woman in the middle of nowhere. Her clothes were tattered and she looked scary, to be perfectly honest. However, they could not just leave her. They can't just let her walk in this desolate landscape by herself. She looked like she needed help. They all decided that they would have to take a chance on this unknown woman. They backed up the car on the empty road and pulled up beside the woman. They asked her if she needed a ride, and she gratefully accepted. Through the initial conversation, the woman seemed like a very thoughtful person and definitely just in need of some assistance. Suddenly, they felt much better about the whole thing. The woman got in the car and they took off. As they drove on, the woman told them her story of how she had been lost. She lost all the members of her party and had been wandering the woods and eventually found a road. She had been stranded for days with only a little water left. The group had just picked her up when she had lost all hope. They all carried themselves proudly as saviors. The girl got in the car and they took off. They had been driving for a while and finally started to see buildings in the distance. It was the first town for miles. There was no doubt in any of their minds that the woman was not going to make it. But as they approached the town, they were all looking out their windows at the old but populated town. They all looked back at the woman. She was no longer sitting in the back middle seat. She was just gone. They pulled into a gas station and called the police. They reported picking the woman up at mile marker 37 and gave a detailed description of what she looked like. The police combed the area and found a body. It was the girl that matched the description of their passenger. In reality, she didn't make it. It turns out that she had been taken to the woods by her husband. He led her deep in the woods and left her on purpose, taking her backpack when she was not looking. She looked for him but never found him. She did not know that he had betrayed her. She wandered around until she found the road. She tried to follow it until she saw a car or found civilization. Little did she know that she had also been poisoned. On the walk, she had started to feel sick from the poison her husband laced in her Mio flavored water. She finally fell down to her knees and collapsed. Her lifeless body had been there for weeks and no one driving could see it as it was covered up by desert plants. During the autopsy, the toxicology report showed the poison. The main suspect, her husband, was picked up by the police shortly after the girl was identified. Justice would be served, all because a group of friends decided to do the right thing and help someone out in need. Be careful out there on road trips. Maybe if you find someone that needs your help, you can bring justice to a restless spirit. A group of friends decided to spend the night at an old, abandoned mansion on the outskirts of town. This mansion had been abandoned for quite some time, maybe 30 years. The story was that it was owned by a well-off man named Victor Ravenswood that had a great stake in the town of, you guessed it, Ravenswood. He married a woman, Claire, that was much younger than he was. Things were good for a while 
until Claire was caught having an affair with another well-off man from a distant town that was a main competitor to Victor. When he found the man in his house, Victor murdered his opponent with fury and rage. He then found Claire locked in a bedroom and took her life for her heinous crime. His weapon of choice was a bowie knife. He wandered into town, as the town square was very busy, and took his life in front of the whole town for everyone to see. The tale of Victor was passed down through generations. The house was abandoned after that. No one wanted to buy the house after all that, so it stayed vacant. Even though they all knew the stories of Victor, they decided to stay overnight anyways to film a documentary for their YouTube channel. They all arrived at the mansion and got their equipment ready. They brought sleeping bags with them and a few lanterns. They initially explored the house and made sure there were no squatters already occupying the mansion. They set up their living area in the middle of the living room. The living room was centrally located in the middle of the mansion with the stairs going up and wrapping around the entire living room with a second story balcony overlooking the living room. As the night went on, Strange things started to happen. Doors would open and close on their own. Strange noises could be heard coming from the walls, and the temperature in the rooms would drop suddenly. The friends looked at each other with excitement and grabbed their cameras. They were able to capture some of the doors opening and closing by themselves. Since they were in a group and thrill seekers, they thought it was more fun than scary. They were trying to figure out what could have caused it. As they were filming, they felt a sharp drop in the temperature. They could suddenly see each other's breath. As they were walking through the halls, the beating was getting louder and louder. It was all fun and games until they saw the shape of a man on the second story balcony. Who was that? They all looked at each other in actual fear this time. They had been through the house and no one was hiding anywhere. The dark figure suddenly brandished a bowie knife and sprinted around the balcony and down the stairs. They all screamed and ran out of the house as quickly as possible. They got into their car and drove away, leaving all their equipment. When they got to a safe distance, they called the police. The police went to the mansion and a group of three officers searched the house thoroughly and found nothing. They collected the equipment and got it back to the group of friends. When they were all safe and sound at their studio, they decided to look at the footage they got and discovered something truly chilling. After chasing the friends out of the house, the figure went to the camera and looked directly into it. Who was that, they thought. They did a search of Victor Ravenwood and sure enough, it was an identical match. They all agreed. Urban legends are usually based on a true story of some kind. If there is a story about a haunted, abandoned mansion, it's a good idea to steer clear of it. Be safe, explorers. Who is the New Year's Eve stalker? It's an urban legend that has been heard for many, many years in many towns. The New Year's Eve stalker looks for someone who doesn't have anyone special in their life, but finds someone the night of New Year's Eve. If something happens, that negatively impacts the meetup, and it leads to that person not having anyone to kiss at midnight. The New Year's Eve stalker is awakened. When the New Year's Eve stalker finds out you don't have anybody, it smells you out, gets a scent of you, searches for you like an animal. Once it finds you, it can stalk you relentlessly until it has you. It knows that you won't be missed, and your soul will be there for the taking for its collection. So don't be caught partying on New Year's Eve without a special someone in your life. It's just too bad that Jenna didn't know about the New Year's Eve stalker story before it was too late. So it was New Year's Eve. Jenna is attending a rooftop party in downtown San Diego. The party overlooks the Padre Stadium and has a pool right in the middle of the hangout area with couches all around it. It is a very beautiful location, only reserved for the richest, most popular elite in San Diego. Jenna is there with her friend Kristen. They are perfectly content hanging out together as friends and not pursuing anybody else for the rest of the night. 
They have their first glass of champagne, and they're feeling pretty good. Their favorite song comes on, and they get on the dance floor and let loose a little bit. They are having such a good time. They have their second drink, and they are really starting to feel good. What a great party. By the time they get their third drink, they're starting to feel a little dizzy and energetic. They are having the time of their lives dancing with random guys they don't care about. Then they both start dancing with two guys that are hitting their nerves. They are both real estate guys and very good looking. After being out on the dance floor for a while, they all sit down on the couches by the pool, all dressed up in New Year's suits and dresses. Jenna and Kristen introduce themselves more formally to Dan and Mark. They all discuss the great time they're having, and there seems to be a definite compatibility with Jenna and Dan, and Mark and Kristen respectively. The two couples are a great match. This seems so perfect. Jenna had not been dating for a long time after a four-year relationship ended sadly in arguments and despair. Jenna had really loved her fiancé, but she was left for a younger woman. Not that she was that old. She was 26, but there's something about guys wanting stupid younger girls to control that drove Jenna crazy. She had a good job as a real estate lender and was making enough money that could provide for a whole family on her own, but she just couldn't get the one. She felt like things were looking good tonight. Dan had a master's degree in business and was a top real estate agent in San Diego County. He was fun to hang out with and had a great smile. How did this catch avoid her radar before this night, as they both were in similar businesses? Jenna was becoming infatuated with Dan, first of all because of what he could be to her, and because he was just so much fun. On the other hand, Mark and Kristen were getting along swimmingly as well. Kristen was a career woman who bought into the full-blown feminism from her mother and decided she did not want a man telling her what to do. But as time had gone on, she had grown apart from her mother and decided to live her own life. And now, sitting across from her on the couch was Mark, who had all the boxes checked that she desired. He was smart, disciplined, and rich. What can I say? Kristen liked money and saw Mark as a very safe bet. The clock struck 11, and they all had another glass of champagne. Cheers. They all said to each other as they drank the glass. The DJ stops playing music and starts talking on the microphone. Hey, attention everybody. It's 11 o'clock. Make sure you find your mate for the evening, because at midnight, you need to have somebody to kiss. They say around here, if you don't have someone to kiss at midnight, the New Year's Eve stalker will come after you. We all looked at each other on the couch like, what did he just say? Around San Diego, we heard a story from the 80s about a guy so desperate for affection of a Mission Valley girl after he met her on New Year's evening and into New Year's Eve night. They're a match made in heaven. However, when alcohol's involved, people forget what's important to them. When the clock struck midnight, he caught her with another man at a club dance floor at the gas lamp district. The man was so angry, he murdered both of them with a knife and took his own life right there on the dance floor. Jealousy can cause terrible things to happen. After hearing the DJ joke about the New Year's Eve stalker, we all looked at each other and laughed. I believe we're good. We have a good group of people here that are really into each other. I don't think there's any worry for me and Kristen. Then 11.15 rolls around. We're all still joking and laughing when Dan looks at Mark and gives him a wink and a nod. He looks at us and says, hey, we'd love to stay, but we gotta get going. What? Jenna and Kristen look extremely surprised. What do you mean you have to go? Dan says, Mark and him have to go meet their wives, but it was nice talking to you both. Dan and Mark give Jenna and Kristen respective hugs when they leave. Kristen and Jenna look at each other completely shocked about what they had just witnessed. What kind of man pretends to be so awesome to a single lady 
and leaves her there with 45 minutes left on the clock. So we sit there for about 15 minutes, stewing over what had just happened. So we go to the dance floor while a couple songs play. We're out there for about 10 minutes. Then we see someone in the back of the crowd that doesn't look like anybody else. He's dressed in a tuxedo with an 80s hairdo, like feathered hair. It's really sticking out amongst the people in the crowd. Nobody else seems to notice him, which is odd. Jenna points him out to Kristen, and they both agree this guy is kind of weird, and he's staring directly at them. So they decide to leave the rooftop. They take the elevator down from the 30th floor to the first. As they do, they see the feathered haired man coming towards the elevator. He disappears as the elevator closes. They both look at each other relieved. When they get to the first floor and start walking through the double doors through the front entrance of the lobby, they turn around to see the feathered haired man once again walking towards them. They start to pick up their pace and get into the Uber that they requested in haste. As they get in, they see the feathered hair man in the lobby coming towards the double doors. They tell the Uber driver to start driving immediately. They got away. On the ride home, Jenna and Kristen are feeling much better. Jenna tries to make small talk with the Uber driver and not getting anywhere. He just doesn't want to talk, so Jenna asks him to play some music. He plays an old 80s station. That's fine, I guess. It's killing the awkward silence. Most people say that 80s music is one of the most calming musics out of all the generations. You can play it in any office, and people mostly accept it. They pull up to Jenna's house and thank the Uber driver for getting them out of a sticky situation. He says no problem and drives away. Kristen and Jenna are still able to see the ball drop on TV, just in time. What a sad New Year's this was, but at least we're safe, because that guy was really creeping us out. After the ball drop, Jenna gets in the shower and is getting ready for bed. When she gets out of the shower, she notices that the TV is playing pretty loud still. She goes to turn it down and sees a puddle of red liquid on the floor. It looks like a pool of blood is in the middle of the living room. She looked to see where the blood is coming from, and Kristen is lying in the corner of the room, dead. She's in a robe and completely vulnerable. She looks around to see if anybody's in the room, but doesn't see anybody. Could it be the feathered hair guy from the hotel? She runs to her room, locks the doors, calls the police, and puts some clothes on. As she's staring in the mirror when she's putting on her clothes, she sees a figure behind her with feathered hair. It's him. She turns around to see him face to face. He says to her, You are alone on New Year's Eve. You're not supposed to be alone. You're supposed to be with somebody who cares about you. Sadly, no one will miss you. It is too late for us. The New Year's Eve stalker was real, and he had taken our souls. This New Year's Eve, make sure you have somebody who's loyal, who has integrity, and who you can trust. And make sure you get that kiss at midnight. A young couple is out on the date, driving around in their car. The town is a fishing club in the northeast coast. There are a lot of secluded areas they could choose to hang out and have a little fun. They decide to park at an old, well-known makeout spot by a lake called Spivey Point. I know what you were thinking. Do people really still put their phones down and go to makeout spots? Sure they do. When they still live with their parents and need a place to go find a secluded spot to partake in displays of public affection, they do it. They get to a nice spot overlooking the town at Spivey Point and park the car. The guy gets out of the car, takes a flashlight, and looks around to make sure it is in fact secluded. The worst thing would be to park right next to some creeper in the middle of the woods. He gets back in the car and starts to woo his girlfriend. As they start to get intimate, 
they hear a strange scratching sound on the car door. It sounds like metal scratching on the side of the car. Since they are on a mountain, there are some gusty winds they have been hearing the whole time they've been there, but this for some reason was different. The sound drags on the car and sharply stops towards the aft right fender. The girl becomes frightened and begs her boyfriend to take her home, but he dismisses her fears and tries to calm her down. As the scratching grows louder and more insistent, the girl becomes more and more panicked. The boyfriend notices and has a concerned look on his face. He is thinking at least the doors are locked. At this point, there is something happening. Finally, the boyfriend agrees to take her home, and they quickly turn on the car. After a couple of turns, they start the car and start driving forward. As they are pulling away, the back right car door handle is pulled by someone or something. The boyfriend steps on the gas more aggressively. As they drive away from the spot they had been hanging out for 30 minutes, they see a tall, dark figure in the rear view mirror holding a hook in its hand. The hook must have been the instrument used to make the metal on metal sounds they were hearing. This was extremely unnerving as they were in close proximity next to this figure when they were in the middle of nowhere alone. They were not, in fact, alone. After a drive that felt very lengthy, they both made it home safely, but they were terrified by the experience. Who was the person at Spivey Point that they saw? They tell their friends and family about the Hook Man, and the story spreads like wildfire. Soon, everyone in town is warning each other not to park at Spivey Point at night, lest they too fall victim to the Hook Man. Curious still, they do some research and look up stories related to Spivey Point in the last hundred years. They discover that there was a murder at Spivey Point in the 1960s. A local fisherman was murdered in his car when he was with his girlfriend. The murderer was the girl's father. The fisherman's name was Jason Garvey. He was a well-liked man in town. His girlfriend was Stephanie Summers. She was known in the town as a promiscuous woman. Stephanie had flattered and convinced Jason to take her out and talked him into going to Spivey Point. Thinking he found love, he was willing to do just about anything for her. He did not know that Stephanie's father had followed them both. Upset at Stephanie's reputation around town, her father confronted her in a fit of rage. When the father pulled his daughter out of the car, Jason tried to protect her, only to end up being penetrated by a rusty hook. With the damage already done, Stephanie and her father buried the body of Jason Garvey at a secluded location up at Spivey Point. They had gotten away with the whole thing for a long time until someone purchased the land right where the body was buried and found it when digging up the land to plant crops. Evidence tied Stephanie and her father to the murder, and they were sentenced for life. It is said that Jason lurks around Spivey Point, seeking revenge for his death. Unfortunately, he is seeking the wrong people. Don't go out to Spivey Point. You might just end up coming face to face with the hook man, Jason Garvey. If you want to make out somewhere, get a room. Spooky Sooner here. Uh, I got one more urban legend that I'm working on, and then I'm going to do another historical uh, haunted American places. That seems to be a popular subject, so look out for that. Uh, please like the video, share, and subscribe. Thank you for watching, and I will see you again.